Bill? That's what you're looking for. Restrooms. Yep, right down there. April 7th, 2017, Scala Essentials Workshop. And we are excited. <laughs> All right, folks, I think it's time we're, we're going to get started. So if you load up the, the main page of the Scala Enthusiast, you're going to want this for most of the rest of the day. It has links to the presentation notes, the schedule, the exercises that we're going to be hands-on and completing, as well as uh, a host of other details that, that will be important. But for now, let's kick it off with the course introduction. So this presentation is brought to you by your local Dallas Scala enthusiast group. We're a collection of folks that are really into Scala. You're going to be learning Scala today. Next week is our uh, monthly meetup. We would love to see you there. <laughs> so welcome to the Scala Essentials Workshop. Uh, obviously, thank you for coming. We're really glad to, to see you here. This is a one-day, hands-on, very intensive uh, workshop. We have an extremely aggressive schedule and high expectations, certainly of us and definitely of you guys. Uh, if you haven't already, uh, you should have installed JDK 8, IntelliJ, along with the Scala plugin, get an SBT. If you have not done that, See a TA, we have the software here. We can make sure that it goes onto your system that everything is okay. Of around 11, 11.30, you will want to have this software because our presentation will shift focus and we will be doing everything from about 11.30 on in IntelliJ. So if you don't have that set up by then, you're gonna be feeling some pain. So, and apologies, I'm a little bit stuffed up. To, we know you guys are here because you love Scala. But at some point, you might actually have to go back to your boss and sell Scala to, to him or her. So, I, and I really believe this. I, I believe that Scala is a, a practically perfect language. Uh, I gave a presentation that had Mary Poppins on it because it is a language that's practically perfect in every way and continues to improve. There are a lot of languages that have stagnated, uh, C++ stagnated for like 20 years, nothing changed. And then all of a sudden everything changed because the, the world moves on. Scala is a language that continues to improve. And one of the things that it has demonstrated is its ability to be a full stack language. It is a language that you can write literally every single piece of your application in from the back end GPU native code through your web server all the way up to all of your browser integration. It can all be Scala. No other language out there that I know of can, can claim that. Now that's the enterprise stuff. That's mo what most of us are doing and that's certainly what this workshop is focused on. But the other thing that, Sc that Scala is moving into is big data. We're taking that over with Spark. So not only are we you know, conquering the enterprise, we are conquering big data and machine learning. But of course, all of that has a cost, or you would think it would have a cost. Uh, one of the things that Scala very much uh, enjoys and ensures is a seamless zero cost integration with Java. Uh, the creator of the language, Mark Noderski, is extremely pragmatic, and when push comes to shove, it is a language that will, that will take the pragmatism over the idealism every day, and part of that pragmatic vision is having uh, an ability to leverage the billions of lines of code that already exist off in Java. So if you're a Java shop, you can bring in Scala today, start writing code, and it should be seamless. Uh, obviously, the, the language is written by a, a math, well, effectively a mathematician, so it's uh, sound, concise, and elegant. Also, and I'm sure that this is part of the reason that you guys are here, there's an extremely hot job market for folks that want to learn Scala. And I was, you know, this is a language that we want to help you learn. The, the goals today, like I said, this is, we have an aggressive schedule. Today we are going to be emphasizing familiarity over proficiency. This is not an extra, uh, Scala is not a language that you learn in a day. Uh, in fact, I'm not sure that you can learn any language outside of maybe Python in, in a day, really. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to barrage you with all kinds of terms and frameworks and libraries and syntax you don't need to remember it all. You'll have the, the presentation notes. What you will want to be able to do is have the magic that you need to know to Google.
because Google is this magic that helps us learn nowadays where we don't need to know everything up front. We can go back and learn tomorrow what it is that we didn't understand yesterday. So we are also going to be emphasizing breadth over depth. So we are not going to be running all the way down into how every little library works. We don't have time for that. So instead, we are going to cover the breadth of libraries, and this is what we'll be doing in the afternoon, actually, the breadth of libraries in the Scala ecosystem that you should at least have some familiarity with. This is our agenda. We are going to try and stick with it uh, as close and tight as we can. Obviously, we'll, we'll go late. That, that's just a fact of life. There will be breaks between sessions, but I'm hoping uh, that we can double up the time that we're working on exercises with the time that we're taking breaks. So if you need to use the restroom, grab coffee, whatever, uh, while you're writing an exercise, don't feel bad. Uh, this will allow us to, to keep on schedule. So. Of course, this is a, a hands-on event. We'll be doing lots of live coding, and we're going to expect you guys to, to be doing lots of live coding with us. So only about half of the content here is going to be presentations like this. And actually, most of it isn't even, even going to be presentations like this. These are actually the only slides in the entire presentation. Everything else is walking through content that already exists online or applications in, in IntelliJ. So if and when you get stuck, flag down one of the folks in the red Scala shirts. They will help you. They will answer your questions and, and do our best to, to make sure that you are learning and having a great time. Our volunteers today are Brian Kaler, Bill Goldsworthy, John McNulty, in the back. Jim O'Flaherty, Henry Katz, Con Monra, Jacob Barber, Casey Lucas, and myself, Mark Kegel. We are very glad to have you guys here. Now, on with the show. And we're actually ahead of time. That, that's awesome. We're ahead of schedule. <laughs> so, thank you for joining us. All right, so our first big topic of conversation, uh, and I'm going to have to sit because we don't have a podium, obviously, and like I said, we don't have slides. This is content that you can find online. So this is the, uh, the Tutorials Point Scala Tutorial. It is not the best Scala tutorial out there. It is not the most complete Scala tutorial. But it is the Scala tutorial that covers the content in the way that will work for us today. So we're going to start off today talking about the core syntax of the language. Uh, but before I do that, I want to show events how many of you are professional programmers? I assume everybody. Good. How many of you write day-to-day -day in Java or have good familiarity with Java? Okay, that's a lot less than I expected, actually. <laughs> um, Scala is a language that if you already know Java, uh, most of it you'll understand immediately. If you come from Python or other languages, you'll appreciate the syntactic conciseness. Uh, what you won't appreciate if you're coming from something like Python is the fact that you do have to put in type annotations. But that means that Scala is a type safe language. It's something that it emphasizes. So let's start going through. I'm basically going to skim this and we're going to live code. Uh, as various sections come up. We'll see how well this goes. I make no promises. But if you don't understand anything, this is content that's online. You can go back and read it. And if you have questions, we'd love to answer. <laughs> so for those that don't know, Scala is very much a, a hybrid language. It does not claim to be any one thing. Now, there are folks within the community that definitely emphasize various aspects. Um, but it is a language that is pragmatic because it sees value in all of these different programming paradigms. So Scala is object oriented. In fact, in a little, in very clear ways, it's more object oriented than Java. And we'll get there and we'll show that, uh, show how that is. That's a little bit odd that you can be on the JVM and more object oriented than Java. But at the same time, Scala is also a language that is more functional than Java. 
and it's because of the, the programming constructs and idioms that the community uses. In fact, the community pushes functional programming extremely hard. So even though we have a language that at its core is pragmatic and imperative, everybody in the community writes functional code. And this is something that uh, as you write Scala and as you learn Scala, you're going to have to keep in mind. We don't really emphasize mutability. We use immutable data structures and bindings all over the place. And so this is going to have to be a shift in mindset because this is how the community codes. Apologies, the, the first time I did functional programming, it broke my brain for weeks. So <laughs> we'll, we'll go with it. Scala is statically typed. Uh, languages like Python, Ruby, Groovy, uh, even Clojure are not strongly statically typed. Scala is a language that is not only statically typed in that you know the type of literally every expression out there, it's a language that doesn't want you to have to do all of that work. So like in Java, you end up with this idiom called type stutter. Give me an A of A equals new A. How many times do I have to say A before the compiler knows that it, that's what I want? In Scala, you can just say, I want an A. And that's all you need to say. It's a whole lot easier because we have type inference. And t the type inference engine is incredibly powerful and is actually the source of the, the most advanced things like type classes that we end up using. Again, with the pragmatism, Scala runs on the JVM, so if you have Java experience and you know how to profile code, debug code, uh, you know, make the JVM blazing, flat, blazing fast, you can do the same thing with, with Scala. Scala also brings in some nice concurrent uh, idioms. We won't really talk about that too much other than to mention future, which Brian will get into later today. In terms of web frameworks, today we're going to be emphasizing ACA HTTP. Uh, ACA is probably the, the most common library out there. It is an actor framework for Scala. There's also a Java version that you can use. The ACA HTTP allows you to handle HTTP requests, basically build up a web server, within ACA. So you get all of the power of a distributed concurrent actor framework. So you can run on literally thousands of nodes while handling, say, pet store HTTP requests. So everything ma matches up and works really, really well. Uh, let's, let's move on. One of the reasons that I really wanted to use this particular uh, tutorial is that it allows us to do this. We can live code in the browser and everybody can see what's going on. The uh, one downside is can everybody read that? It's kind of small. It is kind of small. Let's see if we can. Yeah, that's better. Hey, better. good. Slightly better. Apologies, too, if I start to lose my voice. Not a lot we can do, it, do with it, but we'll, uh, we'll move on. So let's, let's dig through this code. Let's see what's going on. Uh, as you can probably tell, this is Hello World. And what we've done here is we've gone on, we've created a file, hello world.scala. We've compiled it, and we've run the code, and it's printed hello world. This code should look quite a lot different. There are different keywords here than what you might see in Java or other languages. The object keyword is some magic that we'll get into in a little while, but the important point is that there's something called def main here. Uh, every Scala application will have a main method. That's where execution starts. It takes an array of command line arguments and returns, which you don't see here, right? You, this is actually what we call procedure syntax. It implicitly returns void. That is the return signature of main in Java. We have the same signature here. At the end, we don't return any value. We're just done when we're done. So here's print line. It, it prints a string. If we want it to print, Scala is awesome. Now we can see that it actually did that. Yay. <laughs> any questions so far? OK, good. This is stuff that we're going to be doing. Uh, the, the setup environment, we can go th uh, ignore that for now. All right, let's talk about some of the, the different object 
idioms that, that we have. So you just saw the object keyword. That's not a keyword that any other language that I can think of actually has. Object is a language built in singleton. So I'm sure you're all familiar with patterns. If, if you've heard of patterns, you're probably familiar with the singleton object. It is one object of a given type. You only have one of this in, the, in your entire system. In general, enforcing that rule in a language that allows you to create objects like confetti uh, ends up being pretty hard. In Scala, it's actually built into the language with this keyword that there will be one of that type, which is really cool. So, which is also why we end up putting def main in an object, because that allows us to simulate the, the static methodness of uh, void main in, in Java. Of course, we also have the class keyword. This allows us to encapsulate all of the, the familiar OO patterns. We have methods and fields. One of the things that Java 8 introduced was lambdas. Scala has had closures for quite a long while. Uh, we used to simulate them as doesn't matter. Today, uh, as of 212, we're actually using the same mechanisms that Java is using. So all of the performance enhancements, oh god, what's going on? <laughs> I've seen that. You're getting helped. Uh, that's Firefox, that's not where I was. <coughs> All of the performance enhancements that Java is doing around closures in terms of invoke dynamic, uh, we're getting for free today because Java is baking in some of these functional programming idioms, which is awesome. The most important thing about Scala in terms of its OO-ness is traits. Traits are what Java interfaces wish they could be because they allow us to have both multiple inheritance with strict linearization, which is how we resolve the diamond problem, uh, and we can combine interfaces with code. So we all know, of course, that Java interfaces can't have code, only abstract classes can have code attached to them. Uh, but with traits, we get all of the awesomeness of code with interface. The, the one downside there is that using traits from Java is kind of tricky. So, I think we can go through most of this. Scala is, of course, uh, case sensitive. That should not come as a surprise. Uh, class names. We do tend to follow Java coding conventions in a lot of different ways. So we have a package keyword. We put our packages more or less the same way that we do in Java. So, and apologies if I keep referencing Java, even though like half of you don't write Java on a daily basis. Uh, Scala is a language that a lot of folks think of as a better Java. And in a lot of ways, you can write Scala that way. So for all of Java's shortcomings, uh, Scala has corrected them. Scala identifiers are fun. The, the one identifier that you must know about is underscore. Underscore has meaning in a couple of different ways. Uh, obviously, you can name your keywords whatever, just about whatever you would like. And actually, you can name them whatever you would like, as it turns out. Um, underscore is the only thing that has any special meaning, uh, along with the heuristic of never put dollar in any name. Scala, unlike Java, loves to emphasize method names and operator names that are not alphanumeric, that are just a collection of symbols. And we will see this in code today, uh, where we are using things that you, like, is that a method, is that a name, is that an operator? If you come from, say, an old school language like C++, you had a well-defined list of the, the operator tokens in the language's grammar. Scala throws that out because with today's technologies, especially with today's IDEs, as long as you have a well-defined language and you have an IDE, you can always find wherever that method or operator is defined. 
Uh, and especially with the, the Java ecosystem where we can fetch source code on demand through source jars, you can always see what the implementation of code looks like. So we no longer have this, this sort of hidden operator overloading where you can never see what's going on. The code is still there, you can still see it. But you do end up with a coding style that if you're reading it on a web page, can look just like a bag of symbols. And that is definitely something to, that newcomers to the language have to struggle through, and that there are lots of different random symbols that you're going to have to learn. Just like learning any alphabet, if you're learning Egyptian, you're going to have to go through, you're going to have to memorize them. I'm sorry, it's <laughs> as hard as it has to be. So. The, uh, I, I emphasize that, but I should also emphasize the fact that it, there, it is beneficial. Um, while there is a cost, there is an enormous benefit to having something like that. So for example, uh, this thing right here, this arrow, well, what looks like an arrow, is actually the name of a method. Now in most languages, generating a map literal like this would have to be something that's built into the language at the core. It would have to know, hey, these are keys and these are values. In fact, let me do... that just to make it painfully obvious. That is something that in most languages would have to be built in. Uh, certainly Python, Java, well, Java doesn't even have that. Um, in Scala, this is a language that figured out how to do this as a library, which means that all of the power that, that Scala bubbles up is power that you have to. It's not something that you have to go into the core of the language in order to get. Now you might wonder how that particular method works. Uh, when keys and values can be arbitrary. Uh, let's just say that that will be a topic of a more advanced lecture. All right. This is one, uh, you can actually have arbitrary identifiers in Scala. Part of the reason for this is that Scala has keywords <coughs> that are, can be the names of variables off in Java land, uh, things like type. So we needed some way to be able to handle arbitrary names. The way that we do that is with backticks. This is a more advanced feature. You won't see it used all that often. But it does mean that we can have things that are extremely expressive in the language. For example, if you're dealing with, say, HTTP headers, which we won't need today, but you might need to later on, the naming of HTTP headers almost never follows the, the identifier naming conventions in any language, and that's because of hyphens in the middle. We tend to, as we parse those grammars, hyphens end up being A minus B rather than A dash B as an identifier name. Well, with Scala, we can actually name things the way that they appear in other documents, which means that when we're repping our code, we just rep for what we see. And all of a sudden, the discoverability in our code goes way up, because if I have a header that's named, you know, application slash JSON, as my text type. I can actually go and grep for that literal string in my source code and say, oh, that's where the header is. It's application slash JSON. It just happens to be wrapped in backticks. That, to me, is a really cool programming feature. Uh, and of course, if you want to see the full list of uh, keywords that we have, here they are. Don't, rec don't recommend memorizing it. You'll see it soon enough. Comments work as you would expect uh, slash slash for one line uh, and then slash star with a closing star slash for multi-line. One of the things that Scala does fix is that we do not enforce semicolons. We have inferred semicolons. So the same way that we have type inference, we're doing work for you, uh, we infer semicolons as well. So you can leave that off uh, as long as it's unambiguous. Uh, packages are an important, apply dynamic is not important. Okay, this is where it gets fun. Because the Scala type system is not like any other type system that you've probably seen. Uh, the only type system that I can think of that is even, well, 
and Haskell isn't remotely similar at all. So, unlike Java, where you end up with lowercase b byte and uh, uppercase b byte because of boxing, Scala actually has a unified type system from the get-go. You only ever have, hack have access to uppercase b byte. And what the compiler will do is determine whether or not boxing is required as it compiles. So that you never have to worry about it. Now if you're doing interoperability with Java, yeah, you might have to worry about Java Lang Byte and all that stuff. But for any of the primitive types, we do not have in Scala primitive types. Everything is treated as an object. Which is why it's more OO. Because you can attach a method to an int. You cannot do that in Java. So let's actually go look. Unfortunately, that's not legible that well. So we'll try and go through this. Uh, Scala unifies the type hierarchy of all of the types in your system. So like in Java, you have this weird disconnect between primitive types that stand out on their own and object types which are in their own separate universe. For example, you can't inherit from int. It just is int. There's nothing that you can do. You can only ever inherit and do object-like things with objects. In Scala, everything is an object, which is pretty darn cool. But in order to have compatibility, we had to introduce some various notions. So for example, Scala.anyval tells you that this is a value type. Now with Java 9, we're going to be they are going to be introducing value types. And so this particular <coughs> model of what that uh, split between primitive types and object types is going to become a whole lot more concrete as the JVM evolves. The important point here is not that Johnny, Java, or that Scala unifies at the top uh, with the any type, and that unifies over primitive and object types. That's really, really neat. In, in fact, uh, it allows you to do some cool things. The, the important point here in Scala is that it unifies at the bottom. So if you come from, uh, say, a really strong CS background, you might be familiar with the top type and the bottom type as far as the type system goes. So most languages have a top type. Even C had a type, top type in terms of void star. You point to anything. Not a true top type, but close enough. Scala is the only language that I know of, I think other than Haskell, that introduces a true bottom type. And what this allows you to do is write generic code that is well-defined and well-constrained. Because what you can, can do now is say that uh, if I have a list, this list must be between an upper bound and a lower bound. And that lower bound is the bottom type, at least in the most general case. And we actually have two bottom types, uh, null for those types that can take on Java's null and that they're an object type and you can have a null reference, as well as nothing for those things that will just never have an inhabitant in that type. And nothing is actually a subtype of null. Part of the reason for doing this is that Scala is a language where every expression has a value. So let me ask you, if I were to write val x equals 1, or, or just say x equals 1, what is the type of that expression? Well, it's probably going to be int. What is the type of throw new runtime exception? It, it, it should have a type. If we're putting the other programming language, it should be well typed. What is the type of throw? Well, it's obviously not void. It's not unit. Um, because that implies a, a real return value. It, it's a, it, void and unit 
are types that have exactly one inhabitant. So with the bottom type, the bottom type is something that is a type that doesn't even have an inhabitant. It implies that if you have nothing, something went terribly, terribly wrong. And that's what throw new exception means. Something went terribly, terribly wrong in your code. So the type of throw new runtime exception is nothing. Which is nice because now if I have an if statement, an if is an expression that unifies its return types in both the, uh, the positive case as well as the negative case. So if I have if foo return one, else throw new runtime exception, what is the type unification of that so that I have something reasonable? Well, one is an int, nothing is, uh, throw new runtime exception is a nothing. The, the least upper bound of one and nothing is just int. So all of a sudden, because we've introduced a, a reasonable rational bottom type, we've assigned throw as an expression a type, we can unify all of the rest of our constructs into something reasonable. And all of a sudden, now all of our, our statements are no longer statements, they're no longer side affecting their expressions. They return values. So for, as a for loop, is not something that anybody ever thinks about returning a value. For returning a value is something that we do every single day in Scala. And we'll get into that and show you how it works. So we have all of the standard types here. The, the types towards the bottom here are ones that are going to be unfamiliar. Unit uh, is the equivalent of void. You can think of it that way. Uh, null. Uh, lowercase nul, its type is null, and obviously, as you saw in the hierarchy, it inhabits that type null. With nothing, well, you can't write it, but there, there, that type does exist out there. Uh, any is the unification, and then any ref is the unification for object types. So obviously, if you want to see how to write any of the literals, we can do that. The one kind of literal that is a little bit different are symbols. Symbols are the equivalent of intern strings. That means if you have uh, a symbol x and a symbol x any two places in your code, they both refer to the same object. They both have the same underlying memory storage. Uh, these end up being really, really useful in like enumerated types, things like that. So. You can, of course, put you know bad Unicode in your, in your code. Let's see what happens. So here's slash t as a tab, along with a couple of new lines. Uh, obviously, we can see the tab, and we'll just have to take it on faith that the, uh, the new lines are there. <laughs> All right, cool. How are we doing for time? Because I'm guessing I'm taking too long. We've been going 33 minutes. Oh, good lord. OK. <laughs> I need to speed this up. I apologize. OK. So var is the keyword that introduces a new variable. Uh, variables are things that can change their value. So if I say var x, and I wish I had, I know. Oh, they pushed that. Good. If I say var x equals 1, and I say x equals 2, I can do that because it's a var. If I say val y equals 1 and I say y equals 2, that's an error because vowels are immutable. Once you've declared that that value is what it is, you're done. Uh, it's the equivalent of final off in Java. We don't tend to write very many things that are var. We write lots of things that are val. So this goes through, illustrates that quite nicely. We can see how hmm, okay, that's weird. Okay. Scope should be familiar. We follow all the same sane scoping rules as anything else. The one difference is that all names, we have one namespace for the language. 
So if you have a method named foo and a val named foo in the same class, that's actually an error. Because we have one single unified namespace. If you're coming from Java or C or C++, any other languages like that, you'll typically have one namespace for, for methods or functions and another for variables and things like that. We don't do that here. We have one unified namespace. And what that allows us to do is actually on the OO side of things, uh, everything becomes cleaner because now we can override methods with vowels, which ends up being pretty cool. All right. So let's look at class syntax real quick. Classes are defined uh, slightly differently than what you might be used to. Let's actually get rid of all of them. Oops, right there. <coughs> At least, no. They need a main. Yeah, there you go. You're probably used to classes having bodies. We don't necessarily uh, require that in all cases in Scala because you are allowed to list the, ver uh, the fields of a class as part of what looks like a method constructor. And so this class point actually has two fields, xc and yc, both as ints. And they're declared as vowels in that when I construct a point, I now have a, a, a method named xc that I can go and fetch the contents of that point from. So if I want to declare a new point, You can see that it prints one. Now, <clears throat> one of the really cool things that this allows us to do is that we have a primary constructor. So not only do we, uh, well, let's do this. If we declare it as a var, we automatically get our getters and setters generated for us. One single character, and we get all of that boilerplate paid for us for free. So we created it as one, overwrote it with the value four, we print it, we get four. <clears throat> Tough to read, I know, the, the font size here is terrible. In Java and other languages, that would be really, really hard to do. So obviously we can also put in methods. And the def keyword is what introduces methods for us. Methods do not require, if they do not take parameters, parameter, uh, parentheses. So they end up becoming optional. So if you want to have com this combined method take a parameter, now we introduce some parentheses. We say x is type int. We introduce that. <coughs> Oh, right. And that's an error now because it takes, it takes a value. There we go. And we can see that the math works out. This is most of the syntax that you're going to need to know to write code today. There's one other bit of syntax that you'll need to know. Okay. 
So extending classes works very much the same. However, now because we have that primary constructor, you can you can declare alternate constructors. So like in Java, you would have uh, a class foo and then foo of whatever, foo of you know, secondary, third, whatever. Um, the way that that syntax ends up looking in Scala is we pass those parameters onto the primary constructor. The reason for doing this is actually a, uh, a, an oversight in how Java was implemented, in that if you're constructing an object, how do I call a virtual method during construction unless I have already initialized all of my data? This syntax should inform you that we're initializing data before we're doing object construction. And so then if I initialize all of my data first, and I, I pass that data on to my supertypes first, and they initialize their data first, then the constructor can run with whatever virtual functions it wants because all data has been initialized. This is, at least in my opinion, about why half of factory methods exist. Because you end up with objects that have this explicit life cycle of, I, I am created, I must have stuff set, I need an init method. In Scala, you very rarely see an init method on objects because this life cycle is short-circuited because of the fact that we can initialize all of our data up front and do all of our object construction as part of the actual constructor. We don't have to split it apart. So you might be asking yourself, I keep mentioning this constructor where I only see data right here. I see, I see declarations of fields and no actual code. It turns out that when you just start treating things as code, why not put the, the class body as just more code that you're running? That's actually what Scala does. The constructor of an object is this body of code, which ends up being really cool. So if you want to run code as part of creating your location class, that primary constructor is this method body. It's a little bit bizarre the first time that you see it, but that is your primary constructor. That's where code goes. Let me see if there's some good examples here. Eh, not really. Okay. We'll cover that later. Like I said, objects, uh, there's one of them. The type of demo is demo, and there's a singleton object. All right. In terms of access modifiers, anything that isn't explicitly marked private or protected is automatically public. Because we tend to use val and immutable, immutable structures, making it public tends not to matter. the same mathematical operators that you would expect. We have relational operators that you would expect. The one difference, uh, and this I think throws off or delights a lot of people coming from Java, is that equals equals actually does what you would expect in Scala. So in Java, equals equals is reference equality. Basically, are the pointers equal? In Scala, it invokes equivalent. That dot equals method that is in Java that you always forget to call, that is, oops, that is what we're calling in as far as dot, uh, equals equals in Scala. So that things, uh, equivalences work as you would expect. Yeah, logical operators, bitwise operators, all of those work uh, as expected. Operator precedence, there's, there's no surprises there. If statements should be relatively similar to what it is that you've already seen and are used to writing, the one difference with if is that if is now an expression. The final statement in, a, uh, in either code path will be the equivalent uh, value that the if expression yields. So in this speaking, yep. oh, 
in this case, print line uh, returns units, so the value of this if is just unit. Here's an if else. And of course, we can chain if else is just the same way as you'd expect. We're going through uh, while and do while work exactly as you would expect. For loops are a little bit different. And so let's actually jump into what a for comprehension looks like. For the, the syntax of a for loop is completely unlike anything that you've seen. So let's go through and let's, let's look at an example and try it out. This is something that will print the value of A from 1 to 10. You might ask, where did I get 1 to 10? And it's this right here. So we're a little bit like Python in that this is effectively a, a generator for a range that we are then iterating through. In this particular instance, we are iterating through the values of the range 1 to 10. So if we want to make this uh, 1 to 8, we can do that. What's nice is that we don't necessarily have to declare our variable up front. So we can get rid of A. And it still works. And the reason for that is that this expression allows us to introduce new bindings. And so as we iterate through 1 to 8, we can just bind each value to the name A and then use it as appropriate. This is by far the, the simplest way to use for. It's the only way I think today that you're going to need to use for, although if we need to, to go into other things, we will. Uh, but let's just see. It's the case that four doesn't quite work the way that you would expect. Uh, one, <coughs> this expression, one to ten, is again library magic, where two is a method on an int that takes another int and generates a range. And range can give you an iterator that allows you to iterate through. So the same way that you have uh, four expressions in Java where you have four a colon whatever, it's something very similar here. The mechanics are different and what this allows you to do is actually much more similar to what uh, is called do notation in Haskell. Uh, if you've been paying attention to the functional programming community uh, and have heard the name monad, that's where this all comes from. This is actually all monadically driven. It's really, really cool, but this is all that we're going to look at today. So, so would it be true to propose that? Can you do one dot to open parentheses ten mm. close parentheses? Very good point. That means the same thing, correct? Yeah, that is the same thing. Because it is just literally the method two on an int, which is really cool. No other language allows you to do that. What's the type of the two method? Oh, what's that? What's the type that two method returns? The type of that method is actually going to end up being unit. And the reason for that, uh, let's see you if mean we... mean the for expression, right? He asked about the two method itself. Oh, the two. The, that is going to be a range. Yeah. Is there a times? So you, can you say five dot times? And it uh, just goes five times? Well, you just five dot asterisk. Five dot asterisk open ten will give you fifty. No, 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 no. He wants to repeat five ten times. I oh, wait a minute. Five twenty five. No, I want to five. I want to execute the loop five times. And so, like in Groovy, you can say five dot times. There is. I don't remember what the method is. Okay. Um, There should be a way of doing that, actually. Uh, certainly, it's easy enough to write one that would be that, yeah. Well, you could do one, two, five. Yeah. You can, but 
and ignore the A value. Yeah, so th this would just in literal dot execute this block some number of times. Yeah, th that is possible to, to write. For each. So I don't know that it's actually in the standard library, though. It probably is, I just don't know what it is. Okay. And of course, there's there's one until 10, which excludes the last value. Ah. Ah. <laughs> if you want to declare multiple values to iterate over, this is the syntax. Uh, or you can put B on a separate line. You can also iterate through lists. So here, for example, we declare a list of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and we just iterate through it. I don't know why these examples have A in them. They don't need to. Can you go back up? Uh, yeah. Is that the way you would go through a two-dimensional array? The A and the B? Yeah, that is. You okay. you wouldn't do this var A, B. I think this well, is yeah. style that's... But instead of cool. saying for A go on to something and then for B equal to something and then you use A and B as the uh, subscripts, you can do it all in one four. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's it's really quite nice. Or if you want to have, you can have four and then an internal four expression into a four. Yeah. So. All right. You can also, and this is where four becomes uh, starts to differ from your expectations. You can have conditionals in your four block. So for example, if we're iterating over this list one to 10, and we don't like uh, three, we only want to print things that are not three and less than eight. Then we can do that. Which is pretty cool. Yeah. And this is where things really start to diverge in terms of the yield keyword. <coughs> so the yield keyword is what allows the for expression to return a value. And what it will do is say we're iterating over a list, then our resultant type will be a list. So if we have, you know, we're doing the list one, two, 10, and we had that same expression up here where we only have, you know, uh, not three and less than eight, and we yielded that A back, now we would have a list that would contain, in fact, why don't we just do it? Yes, yes, yep. we can see that we just have, we have a new list that's been filtered. This is sort of the core of what becomes our collections library, which is really cool. Can you, can you change list to set? And, the, and notice how no code changes, other than the sets I bore. Yeah. So it figured out it took a set and returned a set, separate, it, the, and the other time it took a list and returned a list. And that's part of the magic of four. Mm -hmm. Why did it come back in a different order? It's oh, because sets are in order. order. <laughs> yeah. But I would have thought they would have gone in an order with that for loop. Not necessarily. So set is backed by hash set, which doesn't have, uh, it, it's not well ordered because it doesn't need it. Okay. Okay. I want to give folks time for the exercises that are coming up. So 
after we've gone through. You got you have 30 minutes till the next start. Nope. Okay. So we've looked at uh, var and val. We've looked at declaring classes. The one thing that we've yet to look at is declaring functions really within classes. The syntax here is a little bit different in that the functions are defined or are declared with def as the keyword, followed by the function name, list of parameters, and then a return type. One of the things that you've probably noticed is that we're talking about types not in sort of C and Java style where it's the name of the type followed by the name of the variable, it's the name of the variable followed by the type. That ordering is reversed. Not only that, there's this magic colon that usually indicates some kind of type description. Does the, is that thing cutting in and out? I Actually, it is on both of them, and so I think it's coming from your laptop. Yep. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. Now you did it. <laughs> now it's dead. So now it's live on both. All right. So I can't bump it. Great. Right. <laughs> that makes it look more like a, a UML, because UML mm -hmm. usually puts the return type after the colon. Yep. So it's actually inspired by languages like ML. So it's, it's something that other languages have done, and it ends up making the grammar a lot cleaner. Because now all of a sudden you always know this is a, a name, a literal name, and a colon, this is always a type. So it, it reduces ambiguity when you're parsing the language. Which is nice. I believe it's also fundamental to allowing the removal of semicolons. Uh, that too, yeah as well as doing type inference, because now yes. I know that I've left off the type, so I need to infer. So like, for example, in this expression right here, where sum is of type int equals zero, I can leave off this int part, and it still knows that sum is whatever type is on the right-hand side here. Zero is an int, so sum has type int. So this is what a method looks like. The return type is off here, following the declaration of the, the function, or not the function body, but the function signature. signature. Yes. Now, unlike this example, we don't tend to write return statements in Scala. The reason for that is that by, def, uh, by construction, the last expression to be evaluated in a function block whether that's an if block, a for block, it doesn't really matter. That last expression becomes the type, the returned type, as well as the value of that function block. So we could actually just write, uh, we could remove return and just have sum there. And if we wanted to be even more concise, we could get rid of sum and just say a plus b. And that actually gets us all the way down to all the line noise and ceremony of writing code goes out the door. We can just write the code and ha have our meaning preserved because it's static. Can you write? Can you leave the sum equal a plus b and it just returns sum by the following? No. If you say if you say var equal var sum equals a plus b, that's going to be a slightly different. Or if you take off the return sum, then that's going to be the type of that expression. Of, of an equals expression, and I don't, I don't know what that is. We I think it's a unit. During the lesson, we can actually experiment with that. Yeah. Of course, in terms of calling functions, calling functions is is uh, definitely what you would expect. The one, I, I highly recommend that everybody read through this section. There's a lot about functions that gets a lot more complicated in terms of the fact that you can nest functions inside of functions, which ends up being really, really useful. So like in Java C and other languages, functions exist at one layer within a class. In Scala, you can have a function inside of a function, inside of a function, inside of a function. You can nest down as much as you would want. You can also, uh, our calling conventions are less strict than other languages. Most languages have strict calling conventions in that when I call a function, the parameters that I pass in are evaluated up front. They're evaluated at call time. We can delay that via some syntax in the Scala language uh, by, uh, via call by name, which is really quite nice. It allows lazy computation uh, so that you can have things like infinite data structures. It's pretty cool. 
The other major difference is that we can have default values for parameters. So that if you don't want to, I mean, if you have a default value that's sane for whatever method you're writing, you can just say, well, it, it's, it's that default value. You can now leave that off whenever you're calling that function, and that parameter will get that default value. And of course, we have some other things that are OO-inspired, partially applied functions. We have a lot of recursion. We have functions with uh, higher order functions, and then you can take a function and return a function. Uh, those <coughs> functional concepts, especially that kind of stuff where we're taking functions and returning functions, we'll definitely be looking at that this afternoon. I don't know that we'll have to write any of it, understand the mechanics of it ourselves today. And of course, anonymous functions, uh, lambdas, as well as current functions. I highly suggest that you read through all of that. Uh, learn the mechanics because it is very useful. Of course, we just, we just don't have time today to go through too much of it. Uh, let's look at what closures look like. Closures are the, the big brother to lambdas. How much time do we have? I'm going to give myself another five minutes, and then we're going to start on exercise. So. Closures are the, the big brother to lambdas. So if you've been working with Java 8 or Python or Ruby, uh, Ruby has blocks, for example. Uh, these allow you to treat code as data, which in functional programming languages is really, really powerful because all of a sudden I can write things like map, which take a function and apply that function to each element of whatever collection I have. So if you're dealing with a lot of data transformation, then this is really, really handy to have because all of a sudden you're filtering, you're, you're folding, you're mapping, you're sorting. All of these things just become functions that you're applying over collections of elements. And you abstract away the code that does the business logic from the code that knows about how things are organized, which is really quite nice. It, the, the thing that a closure adds is that it closes over more than just the local parameters that get passed in so that you can close over parameters in your local lexical environment rather than just the parameters that are passed to your lambda. So for example, if there was another val x in this environment, we could close over and, and use x as part of this closure. The <coughs> syntax here should remind you a lot of, again, the syntactic regularity that Scala has. We have what looks like a parameter list followed by what looks like a body. Now we've left off the, the brackets because in certain circumstances that we can do that, but you can, you can leave them in. This is now a lambda, because it doesn't close over anything else, that takes an it and returns that value multiplied by 10. So we're not allowed to modify the value that are the variables that you can from external to the front, right? That is correct. Yeah, you can only close over vowels, things that, uh, references that cannot change. Now, that doesn't mean that what they point to can't change. So you could close over a mutable list or a mutable string. But the list that you're always going to be pointing to is always going to be the same. So that it's just one level in direction of immutability. So, which isn't great. We don't have like infinite egress there, but oh well. So we can change that. We can have a, a multiplier in, instead. Okay. There's nothing special about strings. Okay, good. So I realized that was very fast and a lot of content, and there's still a lot of content here. I'm not going to go over anything more because I want to get started on the exercises to give you guys a chance to write code. So if you go to your, <coughs> the main page here, and you click on exercises, the very first exercise that we're going to be working on is writing, yay, Fibonacci. Uh, <laughs> If you haven't already set up IntelliJ, don't worry about it. I haven't, obviously nobody's flagging down TA, so I'm assuming that everybody has IntelliJ set up. For now, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be writing code in SCOSTI. SCOSTI is one of a 
a handful of browser-based REPL environments for Scala, in that you can write as much Scala as you would want, actually pulling in whatever libraries you would want as well. It's really cool. It's backed by uh, all of the equivalent machinery that I'll be teaching you guys today. It's just a web browser-based way to write Scala code. And so if you bring this up, you can actually, and I'm hoping you guys that this works, Okay. Okay, cool. So it's All right, so you might want to have something like fib of two or fib of, let's say, well, that'll get rather large, we'll say 23. With worksheet mode on, so if anybody's having troubles flagged down as EA, the link in the exercises should just work. So, I mean, the link that says write a function that returns the nth one? Yeah, the nth Fibonacci number. That takes us to a the beta page. Yeah, so you'll you it's possible if you haven't already signed into your GitHub account, you'll need to sign in. And then uh, when you hit the join the beta, it'll see that cookie and take you take you in. So you click authorize application. Yep. Now you'll need to. Hmm? Um. So I realize that there are a couple of steps that you have to go through. Part of the reason that we're using SCASTI is that this is the new web-based browser environment that Scala Center, which is the official uh, organization that is devoted to teaching folks Scala, this is what they're push, push, uh, putting together, this is what they're pushing. Actually, the environment that you're seeing up here today is a theme that went through literally just yesterday. So it's seeing a lot of uh, development, and it's getting a lot better every day. <laughs> Yeah, he was supposed to fire <laughs> If you want to use an alternate environment because Scosti is full, um, <laughs> oh no, he, he was supposed to fire up more instances this morning. I guess that didn't oh. happen. Uh, Scala Kata also works. Yes, yeah, so that's what I was going to say. Scala Kata also works, as well as Scala Fiddle. So let me bring those up. Because Scala Kata is with a K. Yep. Yeah, so there's Scala Kata. And what happened to yours? Did you, did you snap it or? Excellent. So for if n is zero, then we get the value zero. So tell me what to type. So if n equals to zero, equal equal zero, zero. <coughs> what else? If n one, n equal equals one. Return one. Okay. Else, I join the flip of n minus one. Looks relatively right. You put the R on the first slide. Uh -huh. I think n equals zero R mm -hmm. n equals one. Yep, that's another alternate implementation that also works. So. All right, thank you. That's thank awesome. You. Good. So this is one that should demonstrate uh, a couple of key points about how Scala works. One is that we don't have to type return. It's just that the last value in the, the block is what gets returned. Um, it should demonstrate a little bit about how if else works, that kind of stuff. Okay, cool. So let's move on to our next section. I highly encourage you guys, if you had trouble implementing Fibonacci, go off and do it yourself. 
Also, uh, exercise one is something that we're going to be using later on today. So I, I really highly encourage you to go implement exercise one as well. And that's printing, printing a multiplication table. So, yes. Right, because it's going to open in Scott. Luigi P. So go.